Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. William drove the last kilometers of the road, relying on his own intuition. His ability to anticipate had been working well for him since childhood, and he had developed it with special exercises. Sam told him in detail how to get to his ranch, but William did not try to memorize the details because he hoped to rely on the navigator. Don't worry, friend. You know I've been in more than my share of trouble and always came out a winner. And your dacha, Sam, I'm looking for it blindfolded. He remembers how his comrade looked at him with condemnation. Overconfidence sometimes leads to unpredictable consequences. And I don't have a cottage, I have a ranch. Remember the word ranch. William then laughed at his friend, who tried to organize his life in a Western manner, which was at least strange for a police lieutenant colonel. Remember, I remember that. But tell me, did you bring in any buffalo for breeding? He hoped the question would make his friend think, but Sam just smirked. No, I've got ostriches, but they're not like the ones in the pictures. They're two-legged. Instead of feathers, they're wearing ragged t-shirts and shorts. They swear and like beer. William pulled his eyes out in surprise because he couldn't imagine us losing ostriches in khaki shirts. But Sam laughed, satisfied with the effect on his comrades. You're trying to catch me out of habit thinking you're the smartest. No, brother, I'm the smartest on the subject. My ranch is for a whole other purpose. Come and see for yourself, but I'm sure you'll like it very much. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been so insistent on inviting you. The occasion for the party was a serious one. Sam had just been promoted to colonel, and such events are usually celebrated in a big way, and the culprit decided to throw a party at his ranch. Although William had never been to his old friend's country estate before, he already had an idea of what it looked like. In fact, all the way there William had been doing nothing but stalling his imagination, which was giving him the most ridiculous and implausible options in retaliation for his anxiety. He chose the three most appropriate ones and even voiced them for laughs. When the electronic voice of the guide expressed uncertainty about the correct route, you stuffed solace. And then there's something like a cabin. A ranger's lodge would also seem to me to be a good fit. But these options were even more confusing to the smart devices. So William had to use his intuition. Fortunately for him, Twilight had not yet had time to fully enlist the surrounding space and the former internal affairs officers on the tire tracks on the sandy road and other signs himself determined the right direction. He crossed a small forest, which also not so long ago, judging by the obvious signs, had been overcome by a whole cavalcade of cars and found himself in the open space. It was a plain of hut, or not of deep lugs. Not far away loomed the hulks of the hut that had once stood there, in the replacing twilight this picture looked mystical, and the man involuntarily burst out. Judging by Sam's descriptions, I'm on the right track to try to dial him, but the cell phone did not want to respond to the owner's attempt to call his friend. William and Hartz threw the useless device into the back seat, where a bouquet of flowers was bored alone. Advanced technology, damn it. Four, five, none of this stuff works in the middle of nowhere. Sam picked a good spot. William got back in the car. He might have had to wander the unfamiliar terrain for hours. If it hadn't been for the lights that appeared at the same time near the ghost village, William drove at minimum speed across the field toward the fire, risking a flat tire or a ravine. He was almost there when the navigator suddenly came to life. In 500 meters you come to your destination. The man whined. Wow, now that's real modern technology didn't do a damn thing. When did they almost get there? Decided to take all the credit. I'm not blind, I can see it automatically. The voice wanted to tell him something else. But William turned off the device. Everybody get some rest. You haven't lived up to my trust. I almost got lost. And who makes so many of you? Artificial intelligence? Apparently, it is only designed to be silent when it is necessary to shout out. The host hurried to the car of the newly arrived guest. We've been waiting. Where have you been? William got out of the back seat. The bouquet got a little messed up. I was testing the navigation system, but it's not ready to work in the middle of nowhere like this. Say, couldn't you have picked a more civilized place for your ranch? 
Sam was forced to admit yes. We have wild mushrooming places here every year. Listen, who are the flowers for? What kind of questions to your wife? Sam patted his comrade on the shoulder. It seems, William, that you have completely left the business and forgotten that such events as receiving the next rank are celebrated in a purely male company. And there's no room for pretty ladies on my ranch. It's like a ship, and the traditions are the same. Of course, sometimes, or rather rarely, I ask my women to clean up this den, and they make the place look nice. So your bouquet is inappropriate. Save it for your wife. William carelessly tossed and finishes the flowers back to their original place and slammed the car doors. He didn't want to spoil his friend's mood with tales of his failure, of his personal family life, so he tried to steer the conversation in a different direction. Sam, where's that ranch of yours? I don't see any signs of habitation around here. The newly minted colonel grinned again. It's all in front of you. What are you so surprised about? Or did you expect to see a cottage of two stories and two native entrances? No, my dear, the very word ranch implies something different. Freedom from stereotypes. First of all, knowing your character, I didn't expect a cottage, but at least some semblance of a dwelling. It's just a field. The friend again passed his heavy hand over the guest's shoulder. Don't worry, there are roofs over your head. You can't see my house in the dark, but there's a lot of space here and the river is just a stone's throw away. Tomorrow morning, if you want to, we can go fishing. William waved his head. No, of course he wanted to go fishing, but he was a businessman, he's got a meeting. He has a job, a reputation, money. William grinned to himself, how he'd learned to talk himself into it. Thanks for the invitation but I don't think I can make it. I have to meet a client tomorrow morning. From the side of the fire, where a group of men were crowding, shouted Sam, let's come these pizzas are ready, and people's souls are burning. The host nudged his friend let's go, or my guys will take offense. The pizza today was a great success. It's a pity, of course, that you have a car. You know pizza without an escort isn't the same. William didn't say anything, figured Sam wouldn't break him today. Although the celebration was outdoors, the tables were set in a gazebo-like structure. Everything was modest, but tasteful. The guests were squeezed in, and William was seated in the resulting gap between the host and an unfamiliar boy of about 25. Sam proudly announced young shift just out of the academy. Very promising young man. I really hope that we'll be faithful to the cause of the guy without taking time off from the main duty. I laconically introduced myself to James. And you, William, I know you. We have crossed paths once before. You were a great help to the investigation. William looked at the guy's face and exclaimed happily, the exact case of the missing wives. The guy was in a lot of trouble and the investigation was a dead end. Aha. Uh -huh. And then it turned out that the sufferer was the successor to the legendary Bluebeard. He used to get rid of wives, and then the talented one played the part of the unhappy widower. Yeah, it was a high-profile case. And William was clearly aware that if it hadn't been for his help, the man might not have been caught. James filled his glass and addressed the audience. Friends, this is an extraordinary evening, and I am happy to be presented with the honor of being the first to congratulate our guru Sam. There are many beautiful words in the explanatory dictionary, but among them, there are none that are worthy of this man. Sam has been fighting crime practically around the clock for over 20 years. On his account, hundreds of solved cases and saved lives. This man has brought up more than one generation of professionals, and we are all happy to see him promoted in rank and position. Toward the end of pompous speeches, James was completely confused. But from all sides were heard approving cheers. Well done, James. He really hit the nerve. From the expression on the face of the newly minted colonel, it was obvious that he liked the congratulations. He raised his glass and nodded to William. Come on, friend, guest, muttered Sam. I've only slept in my quarters at the wheel. There is enough room for everyone, and tomorrow you will go to the city with an escort to meet your customers. Tonight's the night. Don't insult me. It was useless to resist any further and William took two gulps and decided on a glass of wine. Toasts followed one after another, and the guests ate quickly.
there came a moment when one particularly creative comrade demanded Sam's epaulets on the table and they should be washed, otherwise they wouldn't hold. James pour some whiskey here. The instigator held out a large cut glass and the volunteer toastmaster filled it to the brim. And now Ben, give us your stars. The unofficial ritual of the men's company was carried out at a high level. At the same time, the officers did not forget those who are no longer in their ranks. The initiators of washing out epaulets sadly said. They talk about us a lot and not always in a positive way, but we do not take offense and carry out our service because we know how important our work is. Let's remember, friends, those who died on duty. Everyone drank in silence and began to slowly fraternize around the clearing. William had already had time to get used to the darkness and noticed a tent nearby. The host followed his gaze. It's the guys from my team who have come to go fishing. If you want, you can join them. You're an avid fisherman. William said with a sigh of regret I'd love to, but I can't work. You realize my clients aren't the kind of people you can just move. Sam looked straight into his friend's eyes. I'm sorry, William, for prying into your soul without permission, but I still can't understand what it is you want to understand, how you traded your vocation for money. I'm sorry to be so blunt. William pretended not to be hurt by the direct accusation of betrayal, but his trembling voice betrayed his agitation. Sam, every man is free to choose what is in his best interest. Yes, I will not deny that I entered the academy as a vocation. And at the time, your help was invaluable. But once I got into the system, I realized it wasn't what we were told it was. William, don't try to justify your act with ridiculous explanations. You were lured with a bunch of greenbacks and you went. But I'm not going to judge you or lecture you. You're right about one thing. Everyone chooses their own path in life, and you're entitled to that too. But remember, one day there will come a time when the shadows from the past will return. William felt sick. He was silent for a long time, and then asked in a depressed voice, Sam, have you had this happen before? I mean your statement about money. Yes, I must confess, it's not exactly a pleasant thing when they come back. I could have saved the bomb back then, but I didn't. It was only centimeters short. Why were they missing? William? The answer is clear because I was scared, and even if it was just a moment of confusion. But those moments were not enough to overcome those damn meters. William also remember well that incident when they were in the Navy. Suddenly a strong storm came, and the commander sent the three of them on deck. Guys, we've got to secure the equipment or it'll blow out to sea. You're nimble, you can do it. Observing all the rules of precaution, the sailors began to fulfill the task. Alex at some point lost his vigilance and was immediately caught by a stray wave. The guy immediately shouted Sam, give me your hand I'm being carried away. Sam was frantically grabbing with one hand whatever he could grab onto, and the other hand was being pulled towards his friend, who was a few steps away from him. Sam too was trying to cope with the elements, and he was seconds short of saving his friend. He saw how another more powerful wave picked up Alex and carried him into the sea. William came to the rescue too late. When Alex in desperation shouted friends, help, William, and threw overboard a life preserver. But the Alex never showed above water again. For several days after the storm the unfortunate man was searched for. But this search was unsuccessful. The whole crew at that time felt the loss hard. Sam never said that the death of his comrade was his fault. William tried to reassure him. You're the one raking up the past. That's why the shadows are knocking at your door. You're not to blame for what happened back then. I mean, we were just kids back then. And to take that step you're talking about, you'd have had to let go of the rope without a safety net, and you'd have been swept overboard too. In my mind, I understand that. My conscience doesn't give me peace. The friends were silent for a while. Then Sam suggested that they should start matchmaking soon. Come on, I'll see you off at least a little hurry before the road. They walked about 50 meters and stopped in front of a modest house in rustic style. This is where I'm staying. I plan to redecorate it later, but time is tight. Sam fumbled for the switch on the wall and an old fashioned lamp flashed under the low ceiling. He settled down on the sofa and I'll be in the next room. If you need anything, call me. 
William saw that his friend wanted to ask him something else, but did not dare. Sam spills everything he's got to say. We're not gymnasium friends, we're practically battle buddies. That's for sure. You know, I met your Helen by chance the other day. She pretended not to recognize me. You don't talk to her at all. William had already had time to lie down on the sofa, but the landlord's question took him by surprise. Yeah, Sam. Do you know how to hit a sore spot? I don't feel like talking about it. I haven't cared about my first wife for a long time, so any contact between us is excluded. Sam flicked the light switch and went into the next room. William was still curled up on the sofa for a long time, and he hardly had time to fall asleep. The excited shouts of fishermen came from the street. The guest realized that he would not be able to get a good night's sleep, and he too went outside. Sam tried to talk him out of it. William, you haven't slept properly yet. Can you get in trouble? It's okay, we'll get past your dogs. And if I get pulled over, you'll have to help me out. By the way, someone promised me an escort yesterday. I thought you were going back to town with everyone else. Are you an individualist? William made no reply to this remark. He hurriedly said goodbye to his host and got into the car. It was almost 200 kilometers to the city. And all the way he thought about money from the past, which recently began to burst into his life more and more often, reminding him of old sins and mistakes. After the collapse of a huge country for a long time, as if by inertia many habits were still in force, and the tradition of youth camps was surprisingly tenacious. Of course, these were not the camps that many people had unpleasant associations with the regime of the middle of the last century. This widespread term united places where gatherings of youth activists took place. Radical changes in society, and even the strong winds coming from the West, could not destroy the desire of the younger generation to participate in the life of their country. In different regions, such events differed in format and composition of participants, although everywhere the program was almost the same. Discussions on exciting topics and exchange of experience. Of course, the main part was announced by concerts, hikes, incendiary discos. William studied at the last year of radio technical school. The young man proved himself with a positive side not only in studies, but also in social life. And he was not surprised when he was summoned to the director of the educational institution Benjamin, whom the students called a hat for his fondness for headgear, without raising his eyes from the papers, said listen. Not in the service, but in friendship to get away for a week at the meeting of youth activists. This offer was so unexpected that the guy was numb at first and only then began to refuse. Benjamin, I'm graduating in a month. Is there no one else to send but me? Trust me, William, there's no one else. You're the pride of our school. And you're the only one the administration can entrust with a mission of great responsibility. Although it was nice to get in, the young man was trying to assert his right to choose. But I had other plans. If you'd been warned earlier, and now you're just coming out of nowhere. William, I didn't expect it myself. Just today they gave me this oath and this order. Benjamin grabbed a piece of paper from the table and shook it in William's face. I've been getting these orders for years. The country's on a new course. And we can't get rid of bureaucracy. William grasped the last argument as if it were a lifeline. But you can just say no. Say we don't have any good candidates. They're all losers and truants. The principal's eyes slowly popped out of his orbits. Do you think you're saying that if I do something like that, I'll be immediately revered? and the technical school will be closed. What do you say you go away for a week? You'll make new friends in the woods. After all, maybe at this camp you will meet the girl of your dreams. William thought it was bad enough that the director had gotten to his dreams. He squeezed out. Okay, you've talked me into going to your camp. A real scandal awaited William at home when he informed his parents about the upcoming trip. Nancy lashed out at her son. William, are you out of your mind? Or is this just a temporary thing? Your brother's wedding is on Saturday and you're off to some dubious camp? Mom, calm down. I'm sure the wedding will go on properly without my involvement. But Jacob will be offended. I'll talk to him and he'll understand. Nancy retreated for an entire evening while she and her son packed for the road, rumbled William. You can't let your family down. After all you have no one closer than family, 
No friend can replace your family. The woman repeated approximately the same text for several hours, which threw the head of the family off balance. Nena, you're gonna be a fly. My ears are ringing. The woman immediately parried. Yes, I've long had all of you not only in my head ringing, but also ghosts at night. You do better as a father to your son. Nina William isn't old enough to tell him what to do. So stop pressuring the kid. What's he supposed to do at a wedding? Look at drunken faces. Leo distracted his wife, drawing the fire of her displeasure on himself. The woman immediately switched gears. You don't like drunken faces. That's what you call your relatives. They'll be so happy when they find out how you feel about them. Nena, they won't know if you don't tell them, but you've got a tongue like a broomstick. You're better off not talking than talking sometimes. That's right, shut me up. I'm always telling the truth, by the way. You're just hiding behind pretty words. If you're disgusted by the mere sight of new relatives, then why even organize such events? The man shrugged his shoulders in surprise. I don't know why. You have a fuse burning in one place all the time. You want us to be your neighbors or your workmates. You, Nancy, you're trying to prove to everyone that you're tough. The woman didn't expect that her desire for truthful information would turn against her. She looked at her husband with an unkind look, and William realized that his father was going to have a hard time. But he could not interfere in the dispute between his parents, because in their family such liberty was not allowed. He took the opportunity to slip out of the apartment quietly. All evening he walked with Molly and his classmate. The girl had long sympathized with William, and he also tried to answer her in the same spirit. When Molly learned of his imminent departure, she was greatly saddened. William, you invited me to your brother's wedding, and I made a new dress for the occasion. Now all the girls are going to laugh at me. The girl's eyes glistened suspiciously. But the young man did not pay any attention to it and asked cheerfully, why will they laugh at your dress? Molly threw off her jacket from her shoulders, which the young man carefully threw on her at the beginning of the walk. The girl angrily began to press her heels into the asphalt winds, saying no, they'll laugh at me because I'm dating an idiot like you, William. I never want to see you again. For more convincing, the slender cutter turned on her high heels, but apparently she miscalculated her strength and barely stayed on her feet. From the outside her prank looked comical, and the young man could not help laughing. Tonya, you'd better be careful or she'll break her forehead. Take care of yourself, boy. The heels bored down the road, and William stared at his girlfriend in the trail. At first he wanted to catch up with the thin one, and even apologize to her. But looking under his feet, the boy realized that the ruined jacket was of more value to him than the incomprehensible relationship with his classmate. You can't even talk to her after that, and yet she pretends to be a refined nature, but in reality a primitive boar. William picked up his jacket and tried to make a quick assessment of the damage. What am I supposed to wear to this camp now? My mother will see me and kill me. Lucky me. There was no one home. So he charged his newly purchased washing machine with a lot of useful functions. It only took half an hour to tidy up an important piece of his closet. That night William fell asleep with a blissful smile on his lips. He had already resigned himself to the fact that he would have to take care of his school alone again. The upcoming trip had seemed like a ticket to an unknown future for the 17-year-old. In fact, that's exactly what happened in reality. The organizers chose a very good place for the meeting. The lake in the heart of the forest area and pine and odor-soaked air. From the first minutes of staying in this place caused an incomparable feeling and the camp itself, contrary to the expectations of most of the participants, seeing these rows of tents, was located in several well-appointed buildings, a recreation center, and a large metropolitan enterprise. It was on this circumstance that the head of the camp emphasized during his speech. Dear guests, I confess, at first I wanted to address you fatherly and call you guys, but when I saw your spiritualized faces, I realized that I should communicate with you as equals in age. After all, each of you has already managed to achieve his own success, albeit a small one. And here in this picturesque corner you all together will be able to outline the main milestones on the way to the future. 
I would like to note separately that this gathering of young enthusiasts would not have taken place without the help of our sponsors. Our famous giant provided us with its recreation center. Let us thank our senior comrades for such substantial support. The first meeting was held on the lawn near the main building and after the words of the chief. The youth began to clap their hands in unison. The speaker waited for a pause and continued. But this is not all good news. In addition to free accommodation in comfortable rooms, each of you receives a memorable gift, all piled up near the improvised tribune of a small gazebo in the center of the lawn. So the chief had to ask the youth to line up in a single line. Somebody made a joke about it. That's the whole freedom thing. And in the first few minutes we were all lined up. William didn't hold back, but it's much better than chaos. I don't agree. There are benefits to the chaotic movement of electrons, for example. This chaos gives birth to energy. William decided not to mess with the guy, whose appearance gave him away as a metropolitan Philistine. Suddenly, however, a six-foot-two big man entered the verbal duel. He gave the upstart a contemptuous glance, and with undisguised defiance. He asked where did you come from so smart? He smelled the smell of fried food and hurried to change location. A cheerful and girlish voice sounded nearby. That's quite a lesson for a bunny. Perhaps force is a more effective argument than intelligence. William was not tall, though he had a sturdy build. But he was surprised to find the author of the striking statement beside him. The girl was so fragile and small that he involuntarily burst out a real thumbelina. He immediately reared back, afraid that the girl would be offended by such a comparison. But she laughed, a direct hit. Everyone called me Thumbelina from childhood, even my parents. That's why I got used to it long ago and even consider it a compliment. While the young man was thinking hard, the girl first introduced herself. Helen, I study at the Technical School of Light Industry. I'm graduating this year. William shook the miniature palm. William, I am a radio technician graduating in a month. The girl flapped her thickly painted eyelashes. That's great and I'm a total zero in technology. I can't even fix an iron. The young man laughed. I'm not a master of iron, or rather, I studied radio electronics. Helen nicely shrugged her shoulders. Both irons and radios are the same to me, because I'm a complete proficient. My physics teacher almost cried when he tried to explain the basic laws to me. William was about to offer a new acquaintance, his services in the field of knowledge. A middle-aged lady appeared out of nowhere and asked young people in a menacing voice. You will still have plenty of time for chatter. And now with your unworthy behavior you bring resonance to the event. They looked at each other and adopted serious facial expressions. The awarding of personal prizes from the sponsor dragged on for a good 10 minutes. So those waiting for their turn began to yawn. And some left the lawn with the words, let's go anyway, there is nothing to catch here. They'll give out notebooks and felt tip pen sets. That's the best case scenario. Helen and William had a long laugh when they finally received their packages. Inside was the standard office set of a notepad and a set of auto pens. The girl shot back. This kit was missing an eraser and paper clips. William decided to be humorous too. And a pencil case would be nice. That would be a first grade kit. Loaded with good cheer, the couple went to the dining room of the main building, where a festive lunch was waiting for all the participants. It was not necessary to persuade the young people, and soon they all pounced on the food. A long-haired brute, frightened by the mere sight of the capital's clever man, crawled out of the dining room into the hall with a satisfied look. I'm ready to stay here for a whole month, if every day will be such soup. Helen could not pass by without a sharp word to such a colorful character. This fellow probably wins gluttony contests. On city day, we also decided to organize a pizza eating contest. So the winner was almost pumped up in the hospital. We also wanted to do something similar, but people did not go. Personally, I think it's wild such contests and in our neighborhood such ideas are doomed to failure. I think it's fun. After all, in many countries such competitions are held. We have many of our own traditions, which are almost gone into oblivion. By the way, in the olden days, the master hired appetite workers, tended the table and watched how he ate. If the man ate a lot of such was taken, 
It was believed that such a laborer would work well. Helen was surprised. It turns out you're not only good at electronics. I'm trying to develop comprehensively. All week, the young people practically did not differ. They went camping together as a small team and took part in a cooking contest at the discos that took place every day on the outdoor dance floor. They were always together too. The smart guy who distinguished himself on the day of arrival tried to approach Helen, but she immediately rejected his advances. His wounded ego made the boy go for a new meanness. During the farewell sit-downs around the campfire, he announced in a loud voice guys, after a week's rest in this camp, some will return home, overflowing with emotions, and others will not come in twos and threes. Someone decided to add fuel to the fire and asked, talk to her, who's X, Y. The guy became obnoxiously flexible while pointing his finger at Helen and William. Of course, William couldn't stand such taunts and without warning, he punched him in the face. He fell to the ground and grabbed his nose. Everyone saw me, but he broke it. I'll have you burned in jail. Do you know who my father is? The big guy gave the kid a scornful look. Don't be scared, man. Nobody's scared of you or your daddy. You got yourself in trouble. That's how you get your ass kicked. Somebody did report the incident to the camp commander. He rushed over and started an emergency investigation. He tried to find out the circumstances of the incident, but found no witnesses. Not wanting to lose face in front of the youth chief vacation sternness, which in no way connected with his image of a mass entertainer, said I still established the identity of the attacker. And you can be sure that this man will definitely be punished. The chief took a long look around the crowd and without saying anything else, left. The young people also began to slowly disperse to their places. This ugly incident completely crossed out the impression of the vacation. An anxiety crept into William's soul that he might indeed be in big trouble before he received his diploma. Under the pressure of these worries, he could not even say goodbye to Helen and forgot to ask her for her phone number. It was only when he got home that William realized that this petite girl was very much in his heart. For the first week, he tried not to think about Helen and even resumed his meetings with Molly. But then he realized that he had to find the one who occupied all his thoughts. Having received his diplomas along with the direction to the first place of work, the guy went not home, but to the city where Helen lived. Since the address of his camp buddy was unknown to him, he decided to make inquiries at the technical school where she was studying in the reception area of the educational institution. He was not greeted in a friendly manner by a lady with a bitterness on her head. Young man, we do not give information about our students. How do I know what's on your mind? Maybe you're a criminal? Sharp eyes took in William's face and he settled on her, but not the affable demeanor. The ladies didn't make him back down from his intended goal. The visitors added a pitiful note to her voice. Well, please tell me at least in what neighborhood does live. I really need to see her. You see, we were in the camp together and Helen lost something there and I want to return it to her. Auntie laughed bitterly, unexpectedly. What fantasists? She lost it. He found it. How touching. I'm going to cry. The woman took a breath and practically commanded to leave your find with me, and I'll pass it on at the first opportunity. I can't give you a home address. William realized that he would not be able to persuade this fury and headed for the exit. But the lady suddenly led him through very quickly. Boy, where are you going? Gave up so fast, he stopped. I'm gonna look around town. Maybe I'll get lucky and meet her. That's a long walk. There are almost 200,000 people in this town. Tell me honestly, how much did you like our Helen? William made a pained, sick expression on his face. Believe me, I can't sleep for a month. The aunt looked around. All right, I'll tell you how to find Helen. She's interning now at three cottage factories as a shift foreman she was put on as a tryout. But I don't know her schedule, so you'll have to go find out for yourself." William was overwhelmed with emotion, and he hugged the woman in gratitude. Thank you. The lady smiled and whispered. What if they have true love? I don't want to interfere with happiness. The young man easily found the right businesses and set up a surveillance post near the entrance. Lines of women came in and out, but Helen was not among them. Only close to midnight three girls were pushed out of the passageway 
and he recognized her at once. Helen Tumbelina. The girl froze in fright and looked around. William came out of his hiding place. I've been waiting for you here for almost eight hours. I'm on the second shift. How did you find me anyway? Helen spoke as if they'd never been apart. And this openness of the girl made their communication relaxed and pleasant. He told him pictures about his visit to the technical school and the conversation with the lady with the old-fashioned hairstyle. Helen laughed heartily. These are our moms, a wonderful lady who takes care of everyone. She doesn't have kids of her own, so she pours all her love into the students. The real name of this bright young thing is Sophia. You must have made quite an impression on her if she gave in to your request. I have to admit, you really surprised me. You know, I didn't expect myself to do that. I just wanted to see you so badly, and you didn't leave your coordinates. You didn't ask for it. You just jumped on the bus and you're out of here. I was still under the impression of that unpleasant scene at the campfire. The girl laughed out loud. I gave that asshole a good kicking too. He pretends to be such a tough guy. He turned out to be a coward. I hate guys who try to play heroes. In reality, they just hide in the bushes at the first sign of trouble. I hope I'm a hero in your eyes. Helen laughed. A hero is a hero. Where are you staying? I mean, where are you staying tonight? William was not prepared for such a question and was confused during his watch at the gatehouse. He hadn't thought about sleeping over, so he said the first thing that came into his head. Don't worry, I'm at the station. I'll go to the factory in the morning. I was sent to the horizon. Helen shook her head. You sure got lucky with your placement. Jacob, not so much, so I suggest another option. At that time they just approached the five-star building where the girl lived. Helen raised her head. Probably mom is not sleeping, she is always waiting for me from work worried. William realized what the girlfriend was hinting at and wanted to hurriedly hide. Helen, please don't. I can imagine how it would look from the outside. I'd rather sit at the station. But the girl had a dead grip on him. William had better not resist. I have normal parents, they're beasts. The girl's mom met them in the hallway and looked at her daughter and her companion Helen with surprise. It's already 1.30 at night is too late to receive guests. The girl poked her mother on the cheek. Mom William is not a guest, but the best companion. Remember I told you about the camp? The woman nodded her head intensely. A light gleamed in her eyes. Joy at this moment showed itself to the stepfather of the girl Helen. You can't be without adventure. The girl thought William had nowhere to spend the night. I cannot leave a friend in a difficult situation. And then everyone can find themselves in such a position. You yourself taught me that people should help each other. Stepfather waved his hand, as if to summarize the line enough of your chirping. Maria will wake up caught on the mezzanine. Just try not to make any noise. I have to be up at 600 M. Wendy helped her daughter with the naughty cot and said good night to her guest. William was experiencing considerable discomfort though. The fatigue was stronger. The guest did not hear his host cautiously sneak into the kitchen in the morning to warm the kettle. It was not until almost noon that he himself was awakened with difficulty by Helen. Get up. One can sleep through everything in the world that way. He jumped up sharply and his movement made the cot fold up. It looked comical, but the boy was not laughing. Disaster. I was supposed to be at the factory by 9 o'clock today. I had to screw it up on the very first day. The girl suddenly suggested, William, I'll go with you. Aunt Kelly's stepdad's own sister works on the horizon in human resources. I am sure she will help to solve all misunderstandings if they arise. The young specialist was welcomed cordially, and no one asked him unnecessary questions. The company had several subsidiary divisions, and William feared that he might be sent to another city. But Helen's relative denied this issue as well. When the formalities were over, the young people decided to take a walk around the city. William could not believe that everything was happening to him in reality and not in a dream. Helen, you are a natural magician. How do you do everything so cleverly? The girl laughed. I guess it's because I'm small and I'm embarrassed to refuse. By the way, I end at school and now at work to settle conflicts. But goodness is punishable. You know that. The girl sighed heavily. 
I know William, but I can't help it. I'm always drawn even to places where I can get my ass kicked. Well, I was born this way. He's always scolding me too. He says my courage might play tricks on me. I see you have a good relationship with him. The girl walked on in silence for a while, then stopped. William, come and sit down. Helen's voice no longer had the cheerful notes that the young man liked so much. It was not difficult to guess from the girl's tense expression that she was trying to decide an important question for herself. William realized that it was not worth pressing her and waited for Helen to speak. And he chose the right tactic, because the girl began her story slowly and with frequent stops. I was only nine months old when my father died. Cases seemingly trivial such every day happens just one drunken daredevil in rush hour rushed along the road in the center of the city and provoked a serious accident. My dad was in it for a month. He was driving his boss home. The amazing thing is that his boss only got a few scratches, and my dad had a fracture at the base of his skull. He died in the ambulance, and he was only 23 years old. My mom told me this story when I was in eighth grade. Until then, I thought Alex was my dad. You know, I can't call him stepfather, because he really replaced my father and adopted me right away. But my mom decided to keep my dead dad's last name. She's a fighter for justice too. You're really lucky, I mean your dad. My dad and I can talk about anything, I'd even trust him with my secrets. Some things you can't tell my mom because she can't keep a secret. My dad won't give anything away. My mom likes to gossip too. She and my dad are always fighting about it. It would be interesting to meet your parents. Helen said this phrase with the obvious expectation that the subject would be continued. But William immediately turned his attention elsewhere. Listen, Helen, it seems to me that fate itself creates favorable conditions for you and me. I'm not a fatalist and I don't believe in such theories. The explanation is simple. Two people who are close in spirit meet one day and a bond forms between them. Some people call it magnetism. In short, they're drawn to each other, and they try to be together. William took Helen's hands in his and asked quietly. We already have such a bond between us. The girl looked into his eyes and immediately averted her gaze, because there was something special in William's gaze that made her heart race. The girl quietly mumbled I haven't figured it out yet. It wasn't a confession yet, but their relationship could no longer be called friendship. They looked forward to each new meeting and still chatted about different topics. But words mattered much less than looks, gestures, and sighs. For almost a year, William had managed to hide from his parents that he had a girlfriend. Helen hinted a few more times that she was eager to meet the parents of the guy she hoped to marry. They were both only 18. William didn't want to rush things. But Helen, like any girl, dreamed of a wedding dress and a lavish celebration. There was another reason that made the young man avoid discussing their future together. And this obstacle was Nancy, that is, William's own mother. He knew in advance how she would take the news of her son's early marriage. When the news was announced to his parents by his elder brother, mother shouted at the whole entrance, Are you so impatient that you're ready to marry the first girl in your mold? After all, no face, no skin their future. Ole could not bear to criticize his fiancé and sassed his mother. According to you normal girls are those who like you way more than a centimeter. But on Nancy such criticism did not make an impression, because her main dignity she considered the impressive size of her figure. She responded to her son's open rudeness by thrusting her chin upward. A real woman fullness does not spoil, but adds charm. It's my individual zest. Nancy applied her beauty scale to all of her son's potential brides. And the bench alone, in her opinion, deserved the highest score. She's a good-looking girl, and she's got everything in place. William would come with the army and marry her. But Jacob was unlucky. Betty, smart though she was, she made it as a teacher. But she doesn't look the part. That's what William's mother always thought. That's why he was terrified of introducing her to Helen. He really didn't want his parent to apply her own standards to her chosen one. But ironically, this process was hastened by a summons to the military recruitment office. Nancy called her son one day in the middle of the week, son, come quickly, or you'll be in trouble. William excused himself from work and went to his district center, where he was registered. 
He still counted on a deferment, but after the medical commission, the commissioner informed him that William would go to serve in the Navy. It seemed to the boy that his soul went into a tizzy, but he didn't show it. When he arrived home, he told his parents from the doorstep that I would be serving in Kaliningrad. And that's a long story. So I decided to get married before I shipped out. The parents collapsed on the couch almost simultaneously. And Nancy clutched at her heart. What are you talking about? What marriage? We could get married every year after we served. But William said in a tone of voice that brooked no objection. No, Helen and I have to get married before we ship out. Son, but we haven't got the money for a wedding. You know what the country's like now, don't you? That's going to be laid off in the fall. They've already given notice, and my own factory. It's about to close. Mom, we don't need a wedding. We'll quietly sign everything and everything. But Helen can come and visit me anytime she wants. Nancy held her hands up to the ceiling and in a voice that made me cry. I wanted to cry and asked who is this Helen that my son has lost his head over. Two days later, William presented his bride to his parents. Nancy, seeing the guest, covered her mouth with the palm of her hand and whispered, God, how tiny you are, William. At least your bride is 18. Do her parents know you've decided to get married? The questions came one after another. The hostess kept her guest at the door. Leo was the first to realize it. Mother, what are you doing here? Nancy carefully pretended to be happy on her face. But it was noticeable that she had very different wins at heart. After dinner, she called her youngest son aside. William, where are your eyes? Can't you see that your Helen has a long nose and a neck like a goose, and she's not very pretty at all? Yeah, the young man looked unkindly at his mother. Mom and one more word and I'll leave this house and never come back. I love this girl and I ask that you treat her with respect. Nancy pressed her lips together resentfully and muttered. Since it's dearer to you to grieve than your mother, it's up to you. Only then you can blame yourself. Two days before the training camp, the young men signed their names. This is an important event. They celebrated modestly in the circle of their closest relatives. William warmly remembered those two wonderful days they had spent together with Helen. There were no other such days in his life. Stories from his past life were changing like images in a movie and he did not notice how he arrived at his destination. The man decided to make a stop at the store at the entrance to the city because he went on the road without breakfast. He got out of the car and remembered that he forgot to alert the clientele. About his arrival in the cell phone directory, he quickly found the right number. Hello, this is Detective William. We had a deal, yes. I'm in town in about half an hour. He turned off his cell phone and asked himself a question. Interesting lady won't tell me what make her come to me, says she'll tell me when she sees me. Yeah, everyone's got their own cockroaches. He took a leisurely snack at Terry's Cafe and drank two cups of strong coffee and a drink with a stream of energy. Got angry with the hanged man, and my mood improved noticeably. Now I'm ready to dig the ground with my nose like a real bloodhound. William quickly found the right house and took the elevator to the seventh floor of the house in the new neighborhood. While the elevator was smoothly going up, the man had time to think. Probably the elite live in this house. Downstairs concierge and video surveillance system installed not heavy. Impressed private detective and interiors inside the entrance. Everywhere reigned perfect cleanliness and everywhere greenery ate indoor plants. William stepped out of the elevator but did not immediately ring the doorbell, which bore a sign with the number 61. First, there was a brisk clatter of heels, and then a painfully familiar voice said, I'm coming, I'm opening the door. This voice could not be confused with any other voice, but in William's soul there was hope that he was mistaken. The door opened, and he saw her. He immediately felt stuffy and began to gulp for air. Helen, she smiled that unique smile, though she expected to see someone else. Didn't he recognize my voice on the phone? No, the phone distorts the timber. Did you arrange this meeting on purpose? She looked at him with a grin. William, you think too highly of yourself, although you always have been. What happened in the past? I died a long time ago. I brought you in as an expert. I read the comments. People say you're a master detective. 
Come on in. Don't just stand in the doorway. He followed her obediently, trying to memorize her route. That's quite an apartment you got there. Status requires it. I've been promoted to director myself, and my husband is always out in public. He heads the deputy corps of our region. The guest stretched out O. Oh, and what happened to such influential persons? The eldest daughter disappeared. More precisely, she ran away. He raised an eyebrow, and you also have a younger daughter? She smiled again. We have two daughters and a son. He is the youngest in the family. He looked at her and couldn't believe what she was saying. The children are adopted. Helen laughed. Why adoptive of their own? The doctor's verdict was wrong. And yet I was a happy mom. All right, let's get down to business. We'll do the nostalgic reminiscing later. That is, of course, if you still want to. Helen briefly recounted her daughter's elopement from home. And at the end, William added, I have some guesses, but I don't know how you take this information. The thing is, until about six months ago, I happened to check out Lisa's Facebook page and learned that she was looking for a guy named Russell. Yeah, but that bad feeling went down my throat. And William tore into town with his shirt on. The buttons clinked on the mirrored surface of the miniature table. The first wife asked with concern in her voice, are you feeling ill? Maybe some water? He shook his head negatively and there was no need to worry. There is nothing wrong with me. Helen looked at him carefully and a hunch struck her. William, have you really given up on Sam? The man took his eyes aside. Yes, it happened, unfortunately. We only lived for five years and then we divorced. Her father is a real usurper and I'm tired of his dictatorship. You don't have to go on. So you ran away from your second wife too. I'm not really interested in your personal life. It's just that there are certain coincidences in this whole story. So with a little thought, I came to the conclusion that my daughter's escape has something to do with your son, and it will be easier for you to solve this case without publicity. My husband wants to run for mayor, and Lisa's antics could have a negative impact on his reputation. Helen, you don't have to explain. I understand. I'll try to help, but it won't be easy. Is there a problem? Yes, I've only seen my son twice since the divorce, and then secretly. My father-in-law vetoed our visits. There was nothing more to talk about. And Helen got out of her chair first. The private detective fidgeted too. And for some reason repeated again, I'll do my best. That's what I hope. At the door, he turned around as if he wanted to memorize her appearance. But Helen looked away. Let's keep in touch by phone. It's better for both of us. If you're okay with that algorithm, I'm fine with it. The door slammed shut for a moment, a fleet moonplate gleamed. William headed for the elevator. He felt utterly devastated, as if a fire had recently raged inside him and all living things had burned out, leaving smoking ashes. He said in a low voice, because it could have been different. The elevator silently opened its doors and the man pressed the number one button. Helen spent the rest of the day under the impression of her meeting with her ex-husband. Barely had she closed the door behind her guest as a sudden weakness told her arms and legs. She had no strength to take even a step, and she leaned against the door of consciousness. The thought pierced, and after all it could have been different, if only what if what? It was a question the woman had not found an answer to for 20 years. Perhaps the mutilated first love had been her fault. Helen immediately understood what did not like the mother of the groom, but she, as usual, took the situation with humor. William, I don't think I've come to the right place. Nancy didn't even try to hide it. The guy himself was upset by such a cold reception of his future wife and did not begin to justify his parents, but only muttered my mother's opinion does not matter. In the future, I will try to make sure that you meet as little as possible. This is a promise. William diligently fulfilled all the five years they lived together. Of course, the years of service in the Navy had to be subtracted from this period. The young people had given up on getting married, deciding that dressing up was more important when the bustle of the noisy conscript send-off had died down a bit. Helen had become very homesick. Wendy tried to reassure her daughter Helen, you won't notice how quickly time will fly by and your William will return. Find interesting activities for yourself and switch. Alexei Alexeevich didn't like his wife's advice. 
Wendy, do you realize what you're saying? You're setting your daughter on the path of sin. The woman took offense at her husband. If you're so smart, why don't you tell me what to do? Helen, my school is strong. And about hints I can say one thing any woman should wait patiently for her husband. You see, William didn't go to a party, he went on duty. You should write to him more often, call him more often. And if you visit him there on the spot, it will be a real holiday for the boy. The girl took her stepfather's last advice as a guide to action. She took an extra part-time job to earn money for the road and presents for her beloved. In addition, Helen helped her mother, who worked at the kindergarten. Kitchen workers. The first trip was timed to coincide with the taking of the oath by the new recruits. The company of the young wife was made by her husband's parents and brother. Helen did not expect them to go as a whole team. But William was very happy to see such a delegation. That trip was marred by the fact that her husband's relatives did not calculate their money, and Helen had to buy them tickets for the return trip. Her mother-in-law, instead of thanking her, dryly remarked that nothing would be lost from you and you would earn more. And Helen worked without weekends again. But the first bitter experience helped her not to make such mistakes in the future, and she no longer warned her parents and husband about her trips. During the visit, William was given a leave of absence for 24 hours, and Helen booked hotel rooms in advance. For the young woman, the time spent together with her husband was priceless. She very much hoped that during one of these meetings she became pregnant and a baby would come into the family. But good luck, passed. One day the mother-in-law mercilessly went through the roller on the daughter-in-law. Helen, you're all idle. You should check it out. Maybe there's something wrong with your womanhood. The young woman had nothing to say to this attack. Gradually, she became more and more distant from her husband's relatives. To which the mother-in-law complained to her son. If earlier William supported the side of the wife, later he began to convince Helen that she should make efforts to maintain good relations with her mother-in-law. On Nancy did not work, as she put it, maneuvers, daughters-in-law. And the relatives began to visit regularly themselves. And usually such visits were unannounced. Wendy often lamented this. God has given us relatives. In a little while we would have to change our place of residence. My husband tried to defend his parents for these ideas. You'd think you'd have a solid lineage. Well, it's just that our saints have a slightly different upbringing. Yeah, especially Nancy. She's so smart. And manners like a bizarre girl poking everyone. And to her name she always adds K. Alex. It's that kind of impudence that pisses me off the most, Wendy. You have to be able to forgive people their little flaws. Nancy is just a very direct and open person. And you can't forget that she grew up in a very different environment. Alex, but there's a limit to everything, and not everything can be blamed on faulty upbringing. Do you even know that you have declared yourself holier than our Helen? The man shrugged his shoulders, which expressed his confusion. But Wendy never managed to tell her husband the insolence of her relative because of Helen's own interference. Mom, please don't wash my new in-law's bones in my presence. And you too are defending that fat fury. The girl looked at her mother with judgment. Mom, the last thing you want to do is stoop to direct insults. By the way, you need to lose some weight yourself. This remark finally pissed off the normally calm Wendy. I'm done enjoying my mother-in-law's company and I wash my hands of it. Alex winked at his daughter, but did it in such a way that his spouse did not notice. When the woman in upset feelings went to the kitchen, he said you on the mother do not take offense, but in some ways she is really right. I know from my own experience that you cannot let your opponent sit on your head. And your main opponent Nancy, try to put her in her place at least once, but do it culturally. Thanks dad, you're my best friend. What did the girl do to her father? and with a good mood went to the kitchen to help her mother. Soon, her father's advice came in handy. It is not known from what source her husband's parents learned about her upcoming trip to Kaliningrad. Her mother-in-law made her happy with a call, and without an approach proceeded to the main thing. Helen, William's birthday is coming up, and that my father and I also want to congratulate him on the spot. The girl immediately realized where the mother-in-law was going, but did not reveal herself. That's your right, but this has nothing to do with me. At the other end, there were sounds reminiscent of grunting not Helen, 
that you're a fool, you're pretending. We have to go and we're short of money. We're out of work, Nancy. What's that got to do with me? The daughter-in-law's repeated question finally pissed off her mother-in-law. She yelled into the phone. Can't you see you've got all sorts of things going on in there? You three work and we are a disaster in this backwater. So instead of helping your relatives, you ask stupid questions. Helen didn't want to continue the conversation any longer and hung up the phone. But it wasn't so easy to get rid of her mother-in-law. The Nancy had been pestering them with calls all evening. And to get rid of her, Wendy had promised to subsidize some of her travel expenses. The mother-in-law took the money, but she wasn't going to pay it back. Wendy wanted to hint this fact to her when they met. But her husband restrained her. Wendy, take care of your nerves. We're not going to rally by losing a few hundred. All right, Alex, I'll listen to you, but next time I won't give them another penny. I'm getting close. William's due date. Helen felt little wings cutting behind her back. She was already envisioning a happy family life with a separate apartment and a bunch of babies. The young woman was sure that she and her husband would have no problems in this respect. She carefully prepared for William's return and bought him a lot of fashionable things, spending all her savings. The young man was pleased with the gift and immediately began to try on the cover. All the things fit, except for the sneakers. He smiled guiltily at Helen. I think my feet have grown a lot. Don't worry about it. I'll wear the old ones. For example, to the old shoes also showed a negative result. The couple had a little laugh. William said confidently, I'll call my people. I'll ask them to send some as humanitarian aid. Helen did not hear the whole conversation between her husband and her mother-in-law, but she only caught William's last sentence. Thank you, mother, I understand everything, and I will never ask you for anything again. She understood and didn't ask him any more unnecessary questions. William, don't be upset, we'll buy you something modest. I borrowed the money from my family. Wendy took out her purse without words and gave her daughter the necessary amount within an hour. The shoe issue was successfully resolved, and the couple celebrated a small common victory, but the mood was spoiled by Nancy. She called late in the evening and began to reprimand her daughter-in-law. Helen, why are you turning my son against his parents? It was unexpected, and the girl did not know what to answer to such accusations. The mother-in-law took advantage of her confusion and continued in the same spirit. So my dear, what I want to tell you, if you want to have a husband on your side, you're on your own. Nancy, but William, your son, and I thought you'd be happy to help him, she thought. It's the son who should be helping us, not us helping him. The man watched his wife and was silent. Only before going to bed, he said, Helen, don't take offense at your mother. It's just the way she is. And I can't change that very quickly. Helen realized that a lot had changed in a very short time. There was a clear change in her husband's character after he came home. It was no longer the same in him. Excitement knew race, as in his youth. He began to nag her on various household trifles. But most of all women were alarmed that her husband was in no hurry to get a job. He categorically refused to return to the horizon, where they were waiting for him. Toward the fall, William shocked her with the news. Helen, I've decided to enter the Academy of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Sam, you must remember him. We served together. Yeah, I remember that guy. And that you're Sam, his father is the chief of criminal investigation. He said he'd help us get into one of those schools, the first place they put guys after the service. So we have a good chance of getting in. Helen couldn't fully digest the information she had received and asked, are you going to enroll as a correspondence student? William laughed merrily, no, Helen. There are no correspondence courses in such institutions, and they have a very strict, almost barracks-like regime. Tears rolled down from the girl's eyes. So I'll be waiting for you again and coming to you for short dates. A shadow of discontent ran across William's face. Helen, and I'm not forcing you. If you don't like it, you can file for divorce. But this is my future we're talking about and I don't want to miss maybe my only chance. She remembers how then for the first time this unpleasant word divorce cut her hearing, and in her heart closed the fear that William could leave her. 
The young woman intuitively felt that keeping the family together would be helped by having a child. But no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't get pregnant. She went around all the doctors, but never heard from them a single opinion. Some found a bunch of hidden pathologies that prevented conception, while others claimed that she was perfectly healthy. The days dragged on in a dreary string. After work Helen would return to the empty apartment that her grandmother had signed over to her before she died. She dreamed of creating a family nest on these square meters. But with each passing day this goal became more and more distant from her. Loneliness pressed so hard on the young woman that she developed a habit of crossing out the days she lived on the calendar. It took Wendy a long time to recover from the shock when she learned about her daughter's strange hobby. Helen, you're going to go off the rails like that. He's throwing his dependence away. It's not all about your William. Why are you fixated on him? Mom, I love him and I can't help it. Wendy sat down next to her daughter. I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. Helen, don't take this the wrong way, but it's hard for me to watch you make yourself empty with the expectations of war. You've started crossing out the days like a prisoner in captivity. Don't you realize that your husband is just using you? And he's doing it brazenly. Helen was crying quietly. Mom, what are you talking about, daughter? Take off your rose-colored glasses. You've been married almost four years. And what has your lovely husband done in that time? Well, he's done the right thing. Kudos to him. But a normal man tries to get back on his feet after the army. Yours is going to school. Which means he's going to piss you off again and you're going to clothe and shoe him. Helen, don't you hate being the tool in someone else's hands? Mom, he'll graduate, he'll get his rank. Helen, by the time he graduates, you'll be 30 years old, and a woman's youth is short. I didn't want to tell you, but I have a bad feeling he'll leave you. Helen tried not to think about her mother's prediction, but many things spoke for the fact that her marriage was slowly disintegrating into small pieces. For the first two years, she herself traveled to the capital every month to deliver a transmission to her cadet. In the third year, the regime softened. Their meetings already took place in a rented apartment. Later, William moved there for permanent residence and paid for his comfortable living. Wife, but the young woman did not lose optimism because her husband assured her Helen. Be patient a little longer. Soon I will graduate, get a well-paid position and we will live with you. After a short date, she would go home and reassure herself, I'll be fine. Perhaps the belief in a better future played a bad trick on the woman. A few weeks after another date with her husband, she felt that something was wrong with her. Helen rushed to see a doctor she knew and the doctor told her, I can't be 100% sure yet, but by all accounts you're pregnant. Come back in a couple weeks for a follow-up exam. Happiness was building out of Helen's sunshine. The first thing she did was to tell William the happy news, but the father-to-be did not show much jubilation. He only asked Helen if it was certain, no doubt about it. Her husband advised her to be careful and not to take any unnecessary risks. Helen, you have to take care of our baby now. I don't think you should be traveling like this. She was pleased that William cared for her. She stopped traveling to the capital for a while. Two weeks later, Helen went to the consultation again and the doctors examined her for a long time. Helen, I will give you a referral for a new examination. It is a very accurate machine, but you will have to wait in line. The young woman signed up for ultrasound diagnostics. And in order not to waste time, she began to slowly prepare dowry for the future child. She knew about the omens, so she did not tell even her mother and younger sister about her secret. And the young woman calmed herself with these words all this superstition. One should take advantage of the moment and stock up on everything necessary, so as not to run around shopping later. Within a few weeks were bought diapers, dispositions, and even for overalls for the baby. When the date of the examination came, Helen went to the appointment. She saw a different doctor, who took a long time to move a small device on her abdomen. Women, you're not pregnant. No, I'm not. Helen began to list all the signs, the doctor listened calmly. I'm sorry, but you don't have a pregnancy, you have a mass that's rapidly enlarging. Let's hope the tumors are high grade. Helen couldn't move her mind. Her dots bored out, and then everything went black. 
She woke up in the same office. The doctor was holding a grip of loss under her nose. You scared us. You can't react like that. And her tongue was cotton candy. But Helen tried to make a point. And you're telling me to laugh at this news. You shouldn't laugh, you should act. In your case, not everything is hopeless. And if you don't waste time, you will be able to bear and give birth to a child on your own in the future. For several days, she walked around like a fog. The doctor's conclusions completely overwhelmed her, and she did not know how to inform her husband about it. The woman never had time to do this, because a new misfortune fell on her family. Alex is dead. The man was returning home after work on his bicycle. He was hit by a dump truck driven by an inexperienced driver. The accident happened near the house. And Wendy as was in a robe and slippers, and ran to the stop, where it all happened. She saw the crowd of onlookers and paramedics from afar, and rushed through the cordon. Let me in, that's my husband. Alex was conscious. When he saw his wife, he smiled and moved. And worry, I'm a tough nut. Everything will be fine. The woman noticed a bloodstain slowly spreading around the man's head. The ambulance paramedic whispered open craniocerebral trauma. He was thrown back against a pole by the impact. Wendy screamed. So what are you standing there for? Take him to the hospital. Save the man. It's no use. The injuries are incompatible. We're not getting him there. The woman bent over her dying husband. But he was already unconscious. William came to the funeral of his wife's father, but tried to act as if the trouble did not concern him. After the funeral ceremony, he hurried off at once. I'm sorry, but I can't stay. I've only been released for a day. Wendy was surprised. Usually in cases like this, you get three days vacation. That's the law. The young man looked at her under the gaze of his wife's mother and muttered we have a different system. Helen decided to walk her husband to the bus station. On the way they talked for a while. William wanted to demonstrate his involvement and advised his wife not to worry. Helen, I realize how difficult it is for you, but try to hold on. After all, the health of our child depends on your condition. The woman looked at him with surprise. I don't like your concern, but I must inform you that there was a problem with the pregnancy. He paused. You mean like a false alarm? Women have that sometimes. Hormone disruption and other disorders in the early stages, very similar to pregnancy. Helen, I expected my husband to react violently to this news because he so dreamed of an heir. But William looked indifferently at his wife and continued on his way. He did not even say the usual words of encouragement. Just before we left, William suddenly asked Helen, don't come to see me yet. I'm a mess. Internships start next week. They send me far away, although Helen was very much hurt by the callousness of her spouse. She kept calm and even with participation asked, and more precisely, can you say where you will be? He smiled cheerfully. I can trust you with all the secrets. I will go to my neighborhood in my homeland. William was well aware that his wife would not dare to follow him, because that would mean a meeting with her mother-in-law. So he completely disappeared from his wife's living space for a month. Only once did the cadet call her to tell her that he was doing well. Helen, I've got everyone blending in perfectly and learning the secrets of the trade at the same time. Soon I'll be a real detective and novels will be written about me, even across several hundred kilometers. Helen saw how happy William was. She wished him luck and thought that he did not even ask how she lived without him. But a month later, her husband showed up unannounced. He was all agitated and Helen anxiously asked William if everything was all right. He grinned nervously. Is there something wrong with me? Why are you asking me such strange questions? You're twitching all over the place and acting all weird. He smirked again. Yeah, there's a little bit of that. Helen, I have a huge favor to ask of you, and I'm listening. Do you remember Sam, your fellow officer? Of course I do. And what was his problem? Oh, nothing much. It's just that he's about to marry a girl who's expecting his child. And how can I help my friend and his fiancé? William was nervous, though he tried hard to be calm, realizing that their finances were tight. Sam is studying, and his girlfriend is also a teacher. So I thought that you and I could give them a small but useful gift. You were preparing a dowry for our baby. 
Helen physically felt several and hunger sang in her heart at once. You don't have to go on. I hear you. All right, I'll get you everything. And I'll make it nice and quiet. Helen, don't bother. It's fine. But I'm in a hurry. I want to catch the last bus. My wife muttered grudgingly to William. You've got another strange thing going on lately that I'm very worried about. You're always in a hurry. He spread his hands in confusion. It's just that I'm not organized and I'm late a lot. A side effect, so to speak. A side effect. From what else would be understandable if you were working and studying. But you live in comfort. It remains to study and enjoy life. So Helen put some newborn clothes in a big bag. After a moment's hesitation, she sent the fur overalls in there as well. William snatched the bag from her hands and said a hasty goodbye, ran to the bus station. It was her husband's haste that alarmed the woman most. She remembered her mother's predictions and decided to find out what was really going on. The next morning, she took the first flight to the capital. She did not tell her mother about her trip, and at work she had accumulated time off. She called the head of the shop, and she kindly treated the request of the best worker. Helen is settling her own affairs as well. If you need additional days, don't hesitate to call. We can work things out with you without statements or explanations. The young woman felt a sense of discomfort about halfway through the trip. She could not yet explain this unpleasant feeling, but she decided to behave carefully. Helen had her own keys to the rented apartment in her purse, and she had no problem getting into the dwelling, where her beloved spouse briefly, but from the first seconds she felt the presence of another woman. Her intuition did not fail her, and after a short tour of the apartment, the woman found in the bathroom in the most prominent place cosmetics and hairspray. In the bedroom, the bed was unmistakable, and on the back of the chair there were flowers and a row. A hot wave rolled up to her throat, and it became hard to breathe. She rushed to the balcony to get a breath of fresh air. The front door slammed. And then came her husband's worried voice. Sam, are you back already? Why did you put a draft in the apartment? You could catch a cold. Helen came from the balcony. No, darling, it's not Sam. Did you make a mistake at this crucial moment? Helen was very much like Themis. She was standing in front of her husband, her head proudly tilted, and he was convulsively swallowing saliva. The brightness of the picture filled, and that caught by surprise husband like a chameleon, then pale, then blushed. Helen, how was it? Why didn't you warn me? Why should I warn you? By the way, I'm paying for this apartment, and you're making a mess of it. And please explain. Who's Sam? Or did your friend have a sex change? Helen, you've got to be kidding me. Don't worry about it. I'll explain everything. She tried her best to keep her composure, though a volcano was raging inside. Carelessly, sitting down on a chair, Helen ordered. But why are you silent? Explain. The man began to circle around near the chair. Helen, this is how it sometimes happens that people love each other, but time passes and feelings fade. I see. You don't have to go any further. Suddenly, William took on an uptight tone. Helen, please don't be so short on offense. This is all your fault. You and I never made it as a family. Stacy's about to give me a son. That was a low blow. So that's who you took the baby stuff for. Your mistress? Don't you dare call her that. She's the mother of my child and we're getting married. Shouldn't you leave now? I don't want Sam to see you. And green bunnies danced before the woman's eyes. She kicked the chair back with her foot. William, I don't care about your worries and I don't care about your article either. And this apartment will have to be imitated. Not by me, by you. I'm gonna call the landlady and she's gonna kick you out of here. No, Helen, you're the one who'll be out of here like a champagne cork. The argument between the couple might have turned violent if Sam hadn't shown up. The girl looked about 19. Her huge belly made her clumsy. She struggled to get into the room and looked at William with an innocent smile. Kitty, here we are. And who is this your sister? The girl looked at Helen in surprise, who was looking for a ruder answer. But she did not have time to answer her rival because a gray-haired man of a rich man's physique came into the apartment. He immediately attacked Helen. Citizen, who are you? And why are you here? I'm the legal wife of this asshole. I can even show you my passport. 
The woman took the document out of her purse because William instantly turned pale. She realized that in front of her father of the pregnant girl disgusting feeling overwhelmed her and she ran out of the apartment. The father of the bride caught up with Helen at the elevator. Did you forget your passport? Thank you. Helen doesn't remember how she got home. The shock was so strong that the next morning she could not get out of bed and had to call a doctor at home. For a few days the young woman was haunted by a compulsive desire to leave this world, but she dreamed of her deceased father Alex. He told her something long, but she did not remember anything from his monologue. But before he disappeared, he threatened her with his finger and very clearly said Helen, don't you dare. You're strong and you can handle this trouble. All this time Wendy did not leave her daughter's side, as if she could sense what thoughts were crowding into her head. The mother comforted her daughter. Believe me, everything will change and there will be agony, and you will surely meet a good man. Your happiness will not pass by. And indeed the pain, betrayal gradually began to subside. And then Helen met Mark. Her health improved too. She had an operation in a private clinic and a year later became pregnant with her first husband. Helen didn't know anything. She had no desire to make inquiries about him. Only one day Nancy showed up out of the blue. Her mother-in-law called her in the middle of the night and sneeringly declared my William, he's really happy now, he's got a wife like you, she's a teacher. You couldn't give birth, stay. You gave us a grandson, such a clever boy. My father and I went to his christening yesterday, so many people were there. Helen asked in an indifferent voice, and you decided to tell me about your son's happiness. It was at night. Nancy, the tube picks up with a reply. But Helen beat her to it, and I am infinitely glad that you have finally found happiness. She carefully placed the receiver on the machine, realizing that the last thread linking her to the past had been severed. Helen was brought back to reality by the voices of the children. Phil was the first to fly into the kitchen and climbed on his mother's lap as the youngest. Mommy, they gave us such junk in the cafeteria today, so I'm hungry. Emily looked at her younger brother with contempt. Mom, he's lying to you. The soup is fine and the second course is delicious. It's just that you and dad spoiled him. Oh, I almost forgot. Lissa called me asking about you. Helen got worried when I asked her where she was after school, but she hung up right away. She just said she was fine and asked me not to look for her. She also said she was an adult and had a right to control her life. Mom, what does that mean? The woman let her daughter's question pass by and wrapped her arms around her head in excitement. God, where does Emily carry her? Sly squinted at her mom. I'll tell you in confidence only daddy do not talk close to her boyfriend. But where are they hiding? I don't know. They've been Facebooking. I peeked at his picture. He's pretty good looking, but he's got red hair. And I don't like redheads. Helen fought the urge to call William for a while, but then changed her mind, realizing that her call might be misunderstood by him. After all, she had nothing new to tell the private detective. William didn't think that meeting his ex-wife would make such a strong impression on him, did he? No, it was not just an emotional outburst, but a blow to the kidneys or another sensitive place. After all, all these years he had convinced himself that Helen would be lost without him. He'd imagined many times that she was living in poverty or suffering from loneliness, but he'd never expected to see her happy and surrounded by a whole bunch of kids. The fact that his ex-wife had hired him and now he was obliged to fulfill the order to let off a little steam. He picked up the pace and muttered, it's okay, I'll get over it. It's actually kind of funny how it works out that way. This once small and insecure girl has surpassed me. Fate had a way of fooling around, but decided to bring us together again. William had to slow down when he got to the center of town. He hadn't yet decided where to begin his search for the runaway girl. Although as an experienced detective, he realized that the most reasonable thing to do in the current situation was to find the mysterious Russell first. The man could not believe that Helen's daughter could be somehow connected with his son. That's what he tried to convince himself. So what? So what if it's a rare name? It's fashionable to call children by old names nowadays. I used to make the same choice myself. William didn't like to travel to his past, 
but his memory against his will insistently return. The day Helen discovered his infidelity. Even today, more than 20 years later, the man could not understand how he got into such a mess. But it all started innocently with the New Year's Eve ball. In the Academy, there was a tradition, according to which all significant holidays were celebrated together with the sponsored. And this place of honor was given to the pedagogical university. William did not like such events, but one day Sam dragged him to such a party. William, you're about to get bored. You need to lighten up a little. It's New Year's Eve, everybody expects miracles. Why did you get one from the magic box? William's been at it a long time. Sam, we're long past the age of believing in fairy tales, and I'm the wife of that man should not attend discos. My friend was even taken aback by such a request. I can't believe I'm hearing this from you. Or are you going to become a monk? William, if you don't want to, nothing will happen. So no excuses are acceptable. And he gave in to his comrades' entreaties. They put on their dress uniforms and went together to the Departmental House of Culture. The evening was in full swing when Sam pulled him aside. Listen, William, if you fall down, I'll introduce you to my full namesake. No, you heard right. This girl's name is Sam. And she is, by the way, the daughter of the district CID chief. So you have a chance to get a powerful patron if you want to. William mumbled something dumbly, but obediently followed his comrade. The owner of the unusual name resembled a gray mouse. There was nothing memorable in the girl's appearance except for the local red hair. She was the first to invite him to a white dance and never once raised her eyes. Out of a sense of politeness, William, after a short pause, asked the girl to the next dance and then walked her all the way to the entrance. Everything seemed to be within the bounds of propriety. But a few days later, Sam at the end of class winked at him. There's a young lady waiting for you downstairs. William rushed to the exit, thinking it was his wife who had decided to visit him off schedule but saw the article the girl stammered and said that she was walking by by chance and decided to stop by. The young man showed tact and offered her a walk. They talked about trifles, and he, between acceptable anecdotes and funny stories, as if unintentionally informed her that he was bound by the bonds of marriage. William hoped that this would scare the girl away, but she said nothing. The next day she came again. The situation was becoming unmanageable and he decided to consult a friend. Look, Sam, this is the first time I've been in this ambiguous position. I need your advice on how to handle this. If Helen finds out I have a groupie, she'll give me a hard time. I looked at my friend like he was a five-year-old kid. You're asking stupid questions. If I was so lucky, I wouldn't hesitate to take that doll to the registry office. Sam, you know I'm married. A wife is not a wall. You can push it away for a while or make a reconstruction in your life and remove the interfering structures altogether. William stared at his friend, eyes bulging with amazement. No, Sam, I don't want a divorce. I love my Helen, and she and I have such plans for the future. William, you're unconvincing, but you're funny. Tell me who your Helen is, shift foreman. I'll grant you, it sounds impressive, but it has no substance and zero perspective either. There's a whole supervisor of threats here. Imagine the career you could have. Sam had a knack for persuasion, which later had a positive effect on his career. He talked and talked and talked, not letting William get his head around it. By the end of the enlightening conversation, he had a different perspective on his marital status. You're really talking to Helen. I'll never amount to anything in this life. Of course I love her, but those feelings don't last forever. William started dating a girl who was in love with him when he suggested that she come to visit him. Sam happily agreed. They first drank tea, and then everything happened by itself. Sam began to visit him in the evenings, and they spent several hours together. Then he would walk her home. Such an algorithm suited both parties, and the young man soon realized that such a life with a double bottom is even much more interesting than the role of a faithful husband. But it is known that trouble lurks around the corner of those who forget about caution. Thunder struck just before the end of third year. One day at tea time, his young lover said in a casual tone of voice, William, we're going to have a baby soon, and I'm already four months pregnant. The light immediately faded in his eyes, because he imagined what the girl's father would do to him. 
But still he asked Sam, are you sure? Could it be a mistake? Did she smile like an innocent child? No, William, I'm sure. I'm already registered. You haven't told your parents yet. She looked him in the eye with a sneer, and he realized that this girl wasn't the shepherdess she'd been pretending to be all these months. No, they don't know anything yet, but they can't drag it out, because soon everything will become apparent and then, your father will destroy me. If we get married, you'll be able to avoid reprisals, comrade generals. The cold turned to heat and William was sweating and shivering. He couldn't get his thoughts together, but I kept waiting for an answer. Sam, you realize I'm in a very difficult situation. Even if I filed for divorce right now, I'd still have to wait three months or more. You don't have to worry about that. My daddy will arrange it. He promised a young mistress immediately engaged in the divorce process. But the real steps did not make. The tangled story resolved itself thanks to an unexpected visit from Helen. After his wife gave him a blowout in a rented apartment, and witnessed this humiliating scene was the future father-in-law. William filed for divorce. Helen also kept her promise, and on the same day the landlady showed up and demanded to vacate the apartment immediately. The old woman felt it her duty to speak out about the moral stability of some men. William, I'm sorry I was wrong about you. I thought you were the paragon of the modern man. In fact, you're a common Alphonse. The woman almost snatched the keys out of his hand, leaving the tenants on the landing. I had to seek temporary shelter at Sam's when he told a friend in great detail about how his wife had uncovered his woof, resolved laughed for about five minutes. Hilarious. Your family history could be the basis for a romance series, Lieutenant William's favorite woman. Really, that sounds great. William even took offense. My life is falling apart and all you have on your mind is baggies. By the way, you're the one who gave me Sam. So some of the responsibility is on your shoulders, says the chief, getting serious. William, don't confuse holy with righteous. No one forced you to take a girl into your bed. You have to take responsibility for your own actions. The marriage ceremony was held in a modest atmosphere because the bride was already in the last month of pregnancy the final part of the celebration was a serious conversation with the father-in-law. The general took the side the newly minted son-in-law and hissed. If I just notice or someone tells me that you are a U.S. womanizer, you'll be in trouble. William mumbled, I get it. Andrew laughed, at least you didn't shit your pants. Don Juan. He patted his shoulder and the young man felt the weight of the general's hand. All right, don't worry, it's just a precaution. Treason is not allowed in my family. William realized that the last rule applied to him alone because the generals marched to the left. The academy was legendary, but Sam's family life didn't work out from day one. The young were taken in by Andrew's mother. In her 75, Sophia was characterized by inexhaustible energy. She got up at 6 o'clock a.m. and loudly turned on the radio in the mandatory complex old lady included morning exercises visiting swimming pools, walks in the park, and much more. Even the birth of a great-grandson did not change the usual schedule of the old lady. It was with her approval that the boy was named Russell. Sophia taught history for more than 40 years and believed that a person's name contains his future destiny. Of course, my grandson is not destined to become a grand duke, but he will be able to repeat the fate of a great mathematician or musician. By efforts of great-grandmother, the boy already in 35 years read fluently and counted up to 100. When he was five years old, the elderly relative took him to audition for a music school. William had no time to raise his son because he was at work all day long. His father-in-law encouraged his son-in-law's zeal in every possible way, putting him on the most difficult parts of the job. But such a tense rhythm seemed beyond the strength of a provincial boy and he quickly burned out. Family life also gave a crack because no one in the house did not consider his opinion. All led by the factory grandmother, stay obediently fulfilled any whims of the old lady. Scandal broke out when little Russell asked his father Papa, what does it mean when they say, do not sow the mare's tail? Someone said Grandma Sophia. She said, you daddy, don't sew up the mare's tail. So I thought, why does a horse need a second tail? Isn't one tail enough? 
the man tried not to focus his son's attention on this common expression. And when his wife came home from work, he interrogated her. Sam tell me, what else have you and your grandmother established? I already know about the mare and the tail. Russell told me. What other epithets did you stick on me? Not a single muscle trembled on the face of my wife. She asked defiantly, is my grandmother wrong? You came here, living off everything. Your father gave you a good job. Where's the payoff? That's how you talk, isn't it? You want to kick back. You and your grandma use a calculator. Figure out your expenses by the day and tell me, how much do I have to pay you? The confrontation took place in the small kitchen. So Sophia immediately drew herself into the room and in a shrieking voice. She willed young man. I will not allow myself to be insulted in my apartment. William had only 10 minutes to gather his things. When he appeared on the doorstep of Sam's apartment, the latter sighed understandingly. Another crisis. Yeah, I screwed up with my wife's grandmother. She turned my son against me, told him I was a no-no in their house. I wouldn't stand for that either. What can you do? Stay with us for a while. We'll figure something out later. William understood perfectly well that his act would incur the wrath of his father-in-law. And in that case, he might not even dream of working in the capital. But he didn't plan to go to the crazy old woman with a guilty head. After a sleepless night, he wrote a report for dismissal and was immediately summoned to the carpet. The general thundered and thundered. What do you think you're doing, puppy dog? You can't outplay me. I'll sign your report, no problem. But remember, I'll write you such a character reference that a wolf ticket will seem like an angel's diploma in comparison. You won't be able to get a job anywhere. Captain. Andrew kept his word. William tried many times to get a job, but they wouldn't even take him to the district office from the countryside. He had to hire a businessman as a security guard when he met Nancy. She advised him to start his own detective agency. Nancy also ran a chain of stores, their grown daughter. She was a little older than William, but she made him feel safe and secure. Their relationship developed smoothly and without unnecessary tension. A year later, their son Ethan was born. It was only then that they decided to get married. William looked around anxiously. He had forgotten the last time he had traveled by bus, so he felt understandably uncomfortable among the passengers waiting for their flight. His faithful iron horses broke down at the most inopportune moment, so he had to go to the workshop to some men he knew. They examined the cars for a long time, but their conclusion was disappointing. Today, it will not work. Only tomorrow and then closer to lunch. William had no other choice but to go to the Dacha village by bus. The previous afternoon he had gone to a familiar address, where he had lived with his family for more than five years. But the door was opened to him by an unfamiliar woman. She shook her head. No, I have no idea where William Sam is. She may have lived in the apartment, but we had a triple exchange, so I can't tell you anything definitive. So the investigation had barely begun and was at a standstill. And then William remembered a friend and dialed his number. Sam surprised William. We just broke up the day before yesterday. What's wrong with you again? The man described his problem in a few words. The colonel stretched out contentedly. You should have just said you wanted to find your ex-wife. Look, William, as a friend, tell me, are you not confusing yourself with them? I have one with my wives, and I'm going crazy. This is three. All right, no offense. I'll text you the address in a couple hours, maybe sooner. William decided to grab a bite to eat. But just in the middle of his morning meal, he got a text message with the promised address. The private investigator decided to continue his search for Helen's daughter. But as luck would have it, the car broke down. There was a loud smack above his head. The man lifted his head up and realized it was the speaker turned on. The bus on the central bus station route leaves at 12.30 p.m. The small cluster of people near platform number eight stirred. And very near and sounded a ringing girl's voice, at which William all inside turned cold. Russell, I'll take the front seat, or we'll be standing all the way down again. He cautiously turned his head and faced the stare of homeless eyes like two lakes. The thought flashed through his mind that it was her, Lisa. And that guy, could it really be Russell? 
Someone behind him slapped him sensitively on the shoulder. Man, why are you standing there like a stone statue? If you aren't in no hurry, it's an idea to step aside. The old man with the pointy beard swung his cane once more. But William dodged the blow and leaped into the saloon with the stream. Two completely opposite feelings were struggling inside him. On the one hand, the excitement of a detective, and on the other hand, he remembered that he was a father and had a grown-up son. Which of these two feelings was more important? He had to decide during the journey. The couple sat down at the very back of the cabin, and William watched them near the driver's cab. He must have been looking at the girl too intently, because she suddenly showed him her tongue. Her companion laughed loudly and whispered something in her ear. Elissa was angry too with a ringing laugh. The man thought how similar they are to Helen and me. Back then at camp we used to walk around like two idiots and make everyone laugh. He turned away and did not look in the direction where the fugitives had settled. Finally, the bus reached its destination. William decided to take his time and left the bus last. Cautiously remembering everything he had been taught, he followed the couple as they disappeared into the house. William was surprised to realize that the address where he was standing now and the address on the piece of paper were exactly the same. So it appeared that Lisa, the first wife's daughter, was now with his son at the second wife's house. In some ways, of course, his friend. Here, if you don't know everyone pretty intimately, you can really get confused. He wondered. Apparently, his son didn't recognize him. So Sam was adamant that she didn't want to remember him. It was strange why she had moved from a well-appointed nice apartment to here. And how did her daddy let all this happen? Maybe they had a fight. There was no end to the speculation. But there was no time for that now. One had to decide what to do next, whether to go in or whether it would be better to call Helen again. Far from the first time, William made the more favorable decision for himself. He pulled out his cell phone. Hello, Helen. I found them. Helen asked me to wait for her. You see, Mark's out of town right now, and I need some support. Liz is a very smart girl, and sometimes I just can't get enough arguments. Our arguments just end up in a stalemate. How often do you argue? A lot. If you're interested, I'll be sure to tell you. Okay, Helen, I'll be waiting. He sat down on a bench near the cabin and thought, and that's what's wrong with him. Helen was a mess, and it did. Now with Nancy, he's earning at his wife's level now, but he feels inadequate, and he's not used to that. He's used to it, so he can't get his head around it. Why are you here? William flinched, turned around. His son was looking at him. Now he was certain there was no mistake. Russell's eyes were unrecognizable because they were his eyes. Hello, Russell. He spoke slowly, calmly, trying to buy a few minutes to figure out what to do next. Hello, but that doesn't negate the question. If you came to us, why didn't you come in? And how did you find us in the last 10 or 12 years we haven't heard from you? William suddenly felt terribly tired of doing and saying things in a comfortable way. I came to see you, but not in a capacity. In what capacity do you think? I came on business, on business. Has someone committed a crime? No, Russell. Sit down, please. The guy hesitated for a minute, but then he sat down. Somehow, he recognized me, and I didn't. There's not even a picture of you in our house. Did your mom recognize you? She got nervous. So I came out to see what you wanted. Of course, no one committed any crime. And I haven't worked for the police for a long time. Where do you work? I'm a private investigator. Russell's eyes flashed with admiration for a second, but he immediately averted them as if to put them out. Lissa's parents hired you. Yes, they did. Russell jumped up. Why are they giving her a hard time? William looked at the boy and firmly said sit down. The boy obeyed. William chose his words. Now the main thing is not to make a mistake, so he needs to forget that he is a private detective and remember that he was a father twice already. Russell, listen to me. Running away from home and making your family worry, that's not exactly mature. It's an adult thing to stand up for yourself, to stand up for what you believe in, to not get bent out of shape. Just because you hit her doesn't make you an adult. You know you're doing her a disservice. If her dad wants her, 
I'm guessing he'll be all over you in a heartbeat. So you chose the wrong path instead of pursuing the right to be with the girl. You hid with her. Now tell me, how long are you going to hide? A month, a year, 10 years, and what's next? Russell bowed his head and didn't think. On this side of things, by taking Lisa, you automatically assumed responsibility for her. You see, if she doesn't learn, you have only yourself to blame. If she gets sick, same thing. What am I supposed to do? They won't let us see each other. You do anything for her, anything. So you have to prove that you can do something, that you're exactly what Lisa needs. I'm not just saying that. And I've done things wrong in my time. I've done things the wrong way, and I've done things that hurt people around me. I'd hate for you to make my mistakes. Russell did. Thanks, I'll think about it. Son, maybe we could get together sometime, sit down and talk. Maybe now I need to talk to Lisa. Russell had just entered the house when a beautiful car appeared in the driveway. From the looks of it, it was Helen's. William sighed and stood up. He was about to have a very serious and very difficult conversation. They were sitting in a small cafe they could barely find. Helen looked at him with huge eyes. I don't understand what you are suggesting. Leave her here and drive home. If Russell really loves her, then Lisa will go home tonight. Helen looked at him carefully. It's like you've changed. He hummed sadly. No, you see, when I saw Russell, I realized that life doesn't stand still. I thought I was just like him a short time ago, but it turns out it wasn't me. He was the grown-up me. I watched them as they rode the bus. They look a lot like you and me, the way we were when we first met. Helen smiled back. Remember when you punched that one? I do. I remember everything. I even had a thought. It's important. Anyway, I realized another one. You can't go back to the past. You can't change it, but you can make it worse. That's easy. While we're chasing. There's no time to do anything at all. Helen, I really hope you'll listen to me and let your daughter make her own choices. Well, you have to make adjustments, of course, but without fanaticism. I got to go. Excuse me, she's waiting. William jumped out of the cafeteria and almost immediately caught a car. Things with Nancy have been really bad lately. And he and only he is to blame. It's happening all over again. Something's wrong with him. And the relationship is falling apart. He's not interested in his family, his son. He's already lost one son. Even if they communicate, there won't be any warmth in the relationship. But Ethan, he seems to have some important competitions coming up. Maybe they've already passed. William was ready to tear his hair out and said one thing to himself like an incantation, just so long as it wasn't too late. He stopped at the florist, then the candy store. He flew up to the right floor in one fell swoop and stopped in front of his door. Whether to catch his breath or to gather courage, he finally opened the door to the hallway. Out came Nancy raised an eyebrow in surprise when she saw the flowers in his hands. You're going somewhere. No, Nancy, these are for you. My wife even dropped the towel in surprise. Yes, for you, I'm sorry. I've completely stopped paying attention to you. It's my fault and mine alone. Let's try again. She looked at him for a long time. William felt as if Nancy's eyes could see right through him. Then she smiled a little visibly well, go wash your hands and I'll go put the kettle on, or maybe some wine. William exhaled. Neither. Where's our son? At training, in case you've forgotten, he's got a competition coming up. The man wanted to lie habitually, but at the last moment he restrained himself. I forgot, I honestly forgot. I remembered only in front of the house and I was very afraid that I missed them. And Ethan won't forgive me for that. Nancy walked over to him, put her hand on his shoulder and reminded him why, Ethan? I want us as a family to go to a coffee shop or a restaurant. They didn't hear Ethan already in the hallway and I'm all for it. Because if I don't eat something right now, I'm going to starve to death. The evening went really well. They talked a lot, as if they hadn't seen each other in years even though they hadn't. William had forgotten how clever his wife was and how funny his son was. After dinner, they went for a walk in the park, ate ice cream and talked again. The man watched with a smile as his son picked himself up, stretching out as girls his age walked by. William realized now that the time had come when things had to change, 
or they might not make it. Russell called a week later. I'm ready to meet you. I need to tell you. Yeah, sure, we'll meet, and you can tell me everything. Tell me where and when Russell called the cafe. And the man quickly said, can I come with someone else? I want you to meet my brother. I have a brother. It's strange that mom showed you me but didn't tell you anything. Dad. Mom, how can I tell you? Well, she's been drinking a little bit since grandpa died. That's why we moved here, because I don't feel any better here. So that cleared that up. But my father's character, which is what it was all about, didn't. But she didn't even call him. He told his family tonight. Nancy listened attentively with her head bowed. Igor's eyes were wide open. He had no idea he had a brother either. Nancy decisively put the cup on the table. William, you have to help her, not so much her as her son. You realize she must be treated. But how? She'll never agree to it. And I think you should talk to her and convince her. He wanted to move out because he didn't want to get himself in trouble, but he didn't. No, absolutely everything. He has to clean up his own mess. Dad, you're not going to believe this. It turned out exactly the way you said it would. Lisa came home and her mother didn't even scold her. They talked. Lisa says that mom had never had such a serious adult conversation with her. And mom said we both have to finish school. And if our feelings don't cool down in the meantime, we'll get married. Well, you see, you don't want to tie the knot. It'll be hard to untie it later. The conversation came and went. It was a difficult one. The woman was hysterical and kept saying it was all his fault. Then she calmed down a bit and was able to listen to him. It's been three years. William, how do I look? Nancy was spinning around in front of the mirror and he was enjoying looking at her. Nancy had changed a lot lately. It was as if she were younger, glowing from the inside out. He sometimes caught himself thinking that his wife was much prettier than many famous models. Charmingly stunning. Nancy sighed. Are you deceiving me again? How can a woman that age looks charming? The man pleaded with Nancy. Don't torture me. You're really the most beautiful. Come on, I'm the groom's father after all. Nancy splashed her hands oh. And our son is a witness for the first time in his life. Let's go quickly. She jumped out of the apartment and ran down the stairs with high heels. William only shook his head. Understand these women five minutes ago have nothing to wear. And here she was already shuffling impatiently by the car. As if he made himself wait an extra half hour. Russell stood like a stone statue next to him. His brother Ethan standing just as still. At first Sam, when she learned that Lisa, the daughter of his first wife, was the daughter of his first wife, stood up, but then she said Mary. It's not fair for everyone to suffer for one man. The ceremony was in full swing. Everyone was listening intently. Lisa was so beautiful that she seemed like some crystal vase. William looked around the hall. Helen with her husband and children smiling, wiping away tears. Her husband gently supports her and strokes her shoulder with his hand a little further away. Sam, she is not alone today. There is a tall man next to her. It seems to be a doctor. They have a very warm relationship. And it looks like things are looking up for another wedding. Then he looked at Ethan in a little while, and Ethan would be standing in the groom's place. And William might well have missed such a moment. He shifted his gaze to his present wife, smiled. Good for him after all. If it hadn't been for him, these people wouldn't be here. Lisa and Russell wouldn't be so happy. He'll explain to his son that you can never put your own desires first. But one thing he realized now was that his life was what it had turned out to be. And now he clearly realized that he didn't want to change anything in it. The time had come and life itself will put everything in its place.